I just uh, there were twenty people on. Just as I said, we were going to start. There's now fifteen. I don't know if that doesn't bode well, but um, <laughs> uh, Rob, Robert's, we, uh, Robert's here. We can start now. Oh, uh, so finally, we're we'll, <laughs> waiting for Rob. Finally, the, the no party starts without Rob. So, Stuart, thank you so much for joining us. Really, really looking forward to this one. Mm -hmm. um, for, those, for those watching, um, Stuart Wildman, uh, so many different hats he wears. I've got a list here, so I didn't forget them. Extended scope physiotherapist. Musculoskeletal sonographer, the director of the ultrasound site, and all the education that comes with it. And forgive me if I've missed anything else, but no, no. delighted, delighted to have you here, and, and that kind of breadth of, of, of knowledge, and, and just to give your take on on ultrasound within the world of podiatry, because I know you do a lot of teaching, um, teaching to podiatrists as well. So, we're you know anyone watching, if you've got questions as we go along, or as always, bang them in the comments, and we'll, we'll get to them uh, as we can. Um, Stuart's teed up a few kind of uh, images for us because we all love images and, and case studies and things so he's going to share his screen for those but beforehand we're going to do the it's a bit like when you go on a course and they show you where the toilets and the fire exits are we're going to go through some of the, the sort of um, the the work that needs to be done before we get to the sexy stuff so uh, the safety the training and things like that which I believe there's um, first off Stu how did you get into diagnostic ultrasound and and you know, what was your motivation to add it to your, to your arsenal? Yeah, that's, that's a, it's a good question. I think it just uh, paved the way for this discussion, probably. I, I was very lucky, and I still am very lucky, um, in that I work in a, a physiotherapy department in London, which was quite forward-thinking. And I had some colleagues who were, were also very forward-thinking and enabled um, us to obtain an ultrasound machine, start to use it, and several of my peers before me um, completed some of the PG cert and case um, training programs that are available out there and I'll go on to talk about um, case and, and those sort of things in a second but um, it basically meant that I was exposed to ultrasound um, quite gradually I'd listen in I'd, I'd try and look at pictures I try and make sense of both pictures and words which was at times was quite difficult and, and you know people find that quite often when they start doing ultrasound and um, it just went from there really and I started to use a little bit of my practice I'd see it, I'd use it with a few patients and then I just started to find that it just added another level of what I could, could offer a patient in terms of discussion, assessment, and also I was starting to pick up things that maybe I, I wouldn't have picked up or wasn't, wasn't so aware of um, from my original clinical examination as well. And I started to develop a real passion, I guess, for the, for the key question, which is what is the difference that ultrasound makes? And how does it impact sort of the, the patient care? And my, my, my real interest and passion, I guess, lies quite specifically around that point of care, that focus um, use of, of, of ultrasound and, and how it kind of fits in and impacts patient management rather than just as an isolated diagnostic. And um, it just went from there. I did my training down at Canterbury uh, Christchurch University, did a fantastic course down there with um, the team. Um, and again, I was really stimulated by the fact that it was, a, it was probably one of the first few courses I've been on that I had such a, a varied um, cohort. So I had people from all sorts of different professions all using MSK ultrasound, but in with slightly different twists, slightly different focuses. And <clears throat> I found that really interesting because we had different skills that we could exchange. So the sonographers, for example, had uh, fantastic probe skills. Um, we had maybe arguably better MSK knowledge in terms of anatomy and, and clinical. And so everyone's exchanging ideas and it became a really powerful but really dynamic um, cohort, which is really interesting. And that kind of just led to, to everything else that I've, I've kind of done afterwards, I guess, in terms of the website and um, lots of geeky, enthusiastic ventures, I suppose. <coughs> well, we, we, you know, you're in good company when, you, when you're talking to geeks. <laughs> um, so if, if, if one of us or someone watching uh, decides actually no more, I, I want to bring it to my practice, uh, you know, you can't just go out there and do it. There's, there's some kind of formalized um, uh, training. How do you do it? Where do you do it? What does it entail? Yeah, and, and as, I, as I said to you, I, I mentioned to Ian, for everybody who's watching, I mentioned to Ian that this is a really important thing to discuss. Um, but also, unfortunately, it's not something I can give a really easy answer to. The ultrasound world is, is, is quite complex. It's quite fragmented. And, and, and part of the issue with that is there's a number of different stakeholders involved in it. Um, but also the growth of, of, of ultrasound, particularly in the point of care. And when I, when I use the word point of care, for those who aren't familiar with it, I refer to um, those areas where maybe there's a clinician using ultrasound as an adjunct to what they do. So podiatry is an example, physiotherapy, um, rheumatology, lots of different, different other sort of domains that are, I guess, less traditional imaging 
professions or it's outside of that traditional radiology department. <clears throat> and the point of care area has, has, has grown quite dramatically. And, and at the moment, I think we're struggling to keep up to speed with that growth to try and provide a framework of governance around it. However, there are some really positive things that are taking place uh, at the moment. So the College of Podarch have recently joined um, what's called CASE. So CASE is an um, organisation that oversees ultrasound education in the UK nationally. And so what they do is they oversee um, any sort of programme around ultrasound education, not just MSK, but all different disciplines. And they basically uh, go through and ensure the rigour of what that training programme provides. Um, so becoming an a member organisation of CASE is actually an incredibly powerful thing and, and, and incredibly beneficial thing as well for the Science and College of Podiatry. And also from my professional background, the Charter Society of Physiotherapy have also done this as well. And so it's now starting to have a bit of an impact in terms of ultrasound education and bringing that point of care uh, influence into what used to be quite a traditional imaging um, domain. So I'm going around, around the houses with this, but the, the, the key advice really is, is, is to consider around case accredited courses and PG CERT programs. Uh, and they're usually university based, um, they're usually at higher education institutions, um, but they're, they're academically based, so they have a level of competency to them, the M level courses. Um, so that's, that's the key message. However, alongside that, um, things such as the term sonographer is not a regulated title. So it's not a, it's not a protected title. So anybody can call themselves at the moment theoretically a sonographer. Um, it's not protected. And so what's happened with the point of care use in particular at the moment, I think, is that because there isn't that regulation around that terminology around sonography, and there's no regulation around your ability to go out and just buy an ultrasound machine, is that people are starting to pick it up and use it in their clinics and use it as an adjunct. And I guess the key message for me today to, to everybody out there really is the importance of safety and training around using ultrasound and I've got a couple of slides later on to try and illustrate how it is such a use dependent skill and how the image that you generate is really the core foundation as, as to then the, the report that you write uh, but also the clinical uh, impact that that report has or that conclusion has um, and so I'll draw on that later on but the, the safety and training is really important now there's a number of other sort of weekend providers out there in terms of courses, and, and I am one of them, ultimately. Um, and they're fantastic courses to do as well, to skill up if you've already done some training. If you're thinking, is this for me, is this not for me, to explore those options. Um, you know, if you want to sort of engage in more training, then do consider, I think, sort of PG Cert case courses and liaise with the college around, the, the, you know, the sort of the, the recommended route to do it. <clears throat> the other knock-on of that is around obviously your insurance and your protection when you're using it, particularly in something like private practice. Um, and that's something that I'm gonna try and keep myself out of tonight if I can, but it's something that I, again, I would just advise people to discuss with their professional body about it, um, because it is a big and important issue uh, in terms of using diagnostics. Um, and there are lots of regulations around that. Cool. Um, quick add on, what's your relationship with with radiology like, and what can someone who, who goes down this road and gets into this expect? Because you're often within medicine, rightly or wrongly, probably wrongly, we put up these artificial barriers where we believe we have ownership of certain modalities. Um, for yeah. And podiatry, we're, we're going to hear this as podiatrists. Do you get pushback? Do you get uh, a bit of beef between well, yourself I mean, I, and radiology? I guess I'm in a relatively unique role in that I work in radiology and I work in physiotherapy. And one of the biggest reasons why I went and worked in radiology was a, I was lucky enough to be approached to be given a fantastic opportunity to work in a great team where I work at the moment, but also because I felt that if I was going to come on things such as this and talk about ultrasound, I needed to understand um, how ultrasound was used in its traditional setting and, and still in the most, most, most common setting, which is in radiology with, with radiologists and sonographers um, performing ultrasound scans. And so, um, yes, there's, there, there, are, there are political sensitivities um, around ultrasound use and its growth in the point of care and whether this is drawing it away from perhaps from more traditional imaging um, centres. Um, but I, I really think that, um, you know, it, it needs to be um, a really positive relationship. I'd encourage anybody who's using ultrasound outside of a traditional setting to go into radiology, see the skills that these guys have and the breadth of understanding all the different imaging modalities but also the breadth of pathology that can appear. Um, you know, I think when we work in, in certain MSK domains, certainly my physiotherapy clinic that I work in, I tend to see a certain chunk of pathology that comes through the door and it tends to be 
in fairly clear boxes and I see some stuff quite commonly. Um, in radiology, the breadth of what you see and what you have to deal with is, is, is much greater. Um, and so it really does give you a, a much greater understanding. So um, I think I, I certainly encourage anybody, to, if they can get into radiology and, and gain some of that experience to do so, but also um, I think we'll come on to this later on, the whole argument and the hot topic of debate at the moment around um, asymptomatic findings, over medicalization, all of these kinds of things, I think just needs to be dealt with with a sensible hat on uh, and, and, and trying to build professional links and trying to uh, improve overall kind of MSK pathways for a multidisciplinary approach, which is probably the most important thing, I think, at the moment. Yeah, I agree. Uh, last question we had before we wanted to get into it was. Um, well, actually, you just kind of touched on it there with regard to some of the, uh, it was about the benefits and the limitations. And I guess you've touched on a couple of the limitations there. Do uh, you want to do that now or is it best we do that? Off yeah, no, we can, we can, we can definitely off touch on limitations. Yeah, we definitely touch on limitations. And, and maybe what I, what I should do is maybe also just sort of tell people what you can see on ultrasound as well, because you can't, right. you can't, you can't see everything on ultrasound. And certainly um, that links in nicely to limitations. But if I maybe just try and for the first time roll out, it'll debut uh, share screen. <laughs> um, fingers crossed this works okay. Um, so if I do that, that, and that, has that worked? Yep. Yeah, you're good. Okay, so um, what you can see on ultrasound, and I guess one of the key things to say here, thinking of the, the, the audience that I've got watching this this evening is that, Foot and ankle region is a fantastic region to use ultrasound on, I have to say, because a lot of things are quite superficial. Um, and so with the improving technology of scanners and high frequencies now on a lot of the probes that are out there, high frequencies mean that you can get better resolution and you can get a better picture. And so the foot and ankle lends itself quite nicely to that, but also because it's quite a mobile area, you can dynamically interrogate things with ultrasound quite nicely. And from a clinical perspective, you can really link that back to the patient's aggravating symptoms and try and tie in the imaging with the clinical presentation, which is always the key thing. But just to give you a bit of an idea for those who are completely new to ultrasound, what you can see with ultrasound, um, you can see things like this. So this is muscle top left here. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving as I do this. Hopefully you can. We can, yep. Yep. So this is muscle top left. So this is a, this is actually a calf muscle. This is the, this is the soleus. This is the medial gastroc here. This is a fascial kind of septum down between the two. So that's what muscle looks like. And you can obviously dynamically move this as you're assessing these areas. This is bone uh, here. Uh, so bone comes up as bright white. I'm just going to move that a little bit because I've got my little zoom box just over my thing. Can you still see that? Yeah. Fine. Yeah, it was, just, it was just covering the next two boxes. I wasn't quite, couldn't quite remember what they were. <laughs> um, so this is bone. So bone is bright white and it's actually a humeral head. So one of the key limitations of ultrasound is you can't see into bone. Okay, so bone, bone and bone evaluation is still best met with other imaging modalities. However, what you can see with ultrasound is you can see here this bright white line is the top of the cortex of the humeral head. And so you can see disruption of the cortex actually really nicely. And in some situations, you can see that um, probably better on ultrasound than you can on some plain radiographs and x-rays. And so this is actually quite a good example because you can usually see sort of great tuberosity fractures quite nicely on ultrasound, but not so easily on, um, on plain radiographs sometimes. But this is bone. So you can see this, this, the superficial cortex of bone and you can also pick up stress fractures, changes like that. I think I've got an example of that maybe um, later on. Um, so that's bone. So bone is bright white in terms of its appearance. This is fluid. This is a baker's cyst, I think. So this is black area here is fluid in the middle. Um, and the nice thing about ultrasound is you can dynamically evaluate things as well. So if that's a fluid collection, you could then squash it and move it around. You can put your color doctor on it to make sure that it's just clear fluid rather than got any flow in it. Um, but you can evaluate fluid um, nicely with ultrasound. You can also then see ligaments. So obviously around the foot and ankle, we've got a number of ligaments that we're we're commonly, in, commonly encountering uh, in our practice around the lateral ankle, uh, in particular, probably. Um, and ligaments come up as a, what's called a hyperechoic area. So in, in terms of the terminology that we use, um, I probably should have done that first, actually, but there's lots of jargon around ultrasound. Um, and when you, when you first start looking at pictures and listening to people talk, it's incredibly confusing and very off-putting as well. Um, so we probably just lost probably 50 people off the chat already, I imagine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but this, is, this, is what you, this is what you would describe as a, a hyperechoic 
um, or hypoechoic actually probably in this situation with looking at this picture, um, ligament. This is an ATFL. So this is, uh, this is the fibula, this is the talus, and this is the ligament coming across. You can see the crisp outline of the ligament. And you can obviously, again, you know, dynamically assess that with ultrasound. You can stress it. Um, you can really evaluate those areas to see uh, on the integrity of those ligaments. Uh, bottom left is a tendon. And I've got a better picture of that in a minute. But this is a tendon running across a finger. Uh, so my finger in this view would be like that, long ways. And this is the tendon running across it. And you can see that the collagen fibers of the tendon, there's a little bit of fluid on top of it here. And then again, underneath, this is all bone. So that bony cortex again showing itself. And then bottom left, if I just drag this across a bit, bottom left, this is a nerve versus a tendon. So a nerve tends to be a bit more hypoechoic in its appearance. Uh, it's more distinct from a tendon in a, in a short axis view. This is a, a long view. It tends to be a bit darker uh, than a tendon as well. Um, these are different views of ultrasound. And um, one of the key things probably to understand is there's two core views with ultrasound. And these are they. Um, you've got a long axis view, which is a tendon like that across the screen, all the way across the screen. And that's me again, looking at a finger like that, stiff shoulder, uh, coming across the screen like that. Okay. And then you've got a short axis view, which is looking down the tendon this way. So you're chopping it and looking up the, up the, up the tendon. Okay. And those are the two key views that people tend to use. And when I'm talking about some of the images later, you'll probably hear me just use those terms. Um, fairly instinctively, but you, those are bits of jargon that you have to get your head around a little bit with ultrasound. But in terms of limitations and, and, and strengths of ultrasound, um, I'll just come back to you guys there. Um, <clears throat> in terms of limitations for, for ultrasound, then some of the big things around ultrasound that are limitations are, are the depth of what you're trying to visualize. So we know with ultrasound that to get to a deeper depth of tissue, you have to lower the frequency that reduces the resolution and quality of the image you're getting. So tissues that are deeper uh, into areas are more difficult to see really well with ultrasound. Um, for the foot and ankle, that you're not really going to encounter that problem a huge amount. You might start to up through the calf if it's particularly big, but anything around the ankle, certainly into the forefoot, you won't get that so much. Some things you do find a bit tricky are things like the plantar fascia. If someone's got a very, very thick sole, their skin and their dermal layer is quite thick, then it can really attenuate or weaken the beam. And so again, your image quality can sometimes struggle. And this is where the training is really important because your ability to understand the controls, optimize your image, try and improve the picture as much as you can to make a good conclusion um, is really important. But you're also, I guess also though, you are dependent upon the quality of the machine. And there is, there's a huge variety of, of machines out there now. Um, yeah, sorry, Craig, go on. So, I was just going to say, the first picture you picked pick up, you actually said something that yeah. struck, struck a chord with me. You mentioned about being yeah. able to evaluate things dynamically by moving it. I never yeah. forget you know, when I used to first start referring people for ultrasounds, I'd get, yeah. you'd get the picture back and you'd get the report back and you'd read the report and look at the picture. And I thought, how the hell are they seeing that? I'd look at the, but when I first got to play with a machine, I remember putting it, the probe under the meth heads and moving it. And then yeah, yeah. bang, it clicked. Ah, yeah, yeah. you yeah. can see the capture, you see the tendon. So it was actually, it was yeah, actually yeah. moving a structure under ultrasound finally made me realize, oh, I now know what they're seeing. And, and it, that's when it finally made sense to me was, was actually looking at something dynamic. And, quite, and, yeah. and even with students, quite enjoyed just moving it and showing them the anatomy. And they, they finally get it. <laughs> It's, it's, it's phenomenal for your anatomy and, and I, you know, I always just, I, you know, if you'd asked me five, six years ago, how good's your anatomy, Stu, I'd probably said, yeah, it's all right, it's all right. But as we most of us would say, yeah, it's probably all right. You know, I, I, I knew my anatomy pretty well around most things. But, you know, when you start using ultrasound, you just, your whole, whole perspective and knowledge of anatomy is completely different. It's so enhanced and you start to really appreciate as well the relationships of, of adjacent structures to each other. Yeah. I think that's one really important thing. So you start to really start to see that you've got a region, say, of, of pain or you've got a region of, of dysfunction. And within that, you start to really understand how different structures can, can react and, and relate to each other, particularly through different ranges of movement on the different sort of functional positions. Um, and so, yeah, it, for anatomy, it's absolutely fantastic. And the dynamic stuff is, I think, is where it, it really is, is quite a unique modality in some ways um, because you can – you can really try to correlate with what you're doing in clinic. And around the front of the ankle, for example, ankle impingements, those kinds of things. Um, I remember, you know, I used to, you know, we used to try assess and treat people with anterior ankle impingement. And 
do various sort of manual therapy techniques to try and improve range and these kinds of things. And sometimes now when I'm using imaging, I can actually visualize how that ankle is moving through a dorsiflexion, how it, how it would respond to a, a functional l- sort of lunge uh, and actually see what the bony joint is doing. And sometimes if you've got large osteophytes or you've got other sort of tissue impingement, you can visualize that quite, quite nice in ultrasound and it can at times change your management around it. So the dynamic stuff I think is, 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 a, is a big positive. One other thing I'll just mention about limitations is you can't see into joints. That's a, it's always a big thing, I think. People always sort of start thinking about structures that you can see on ultrasound and uh, you, know, you start thinking of all the different pathologies that you can see. You can't see into a joint recess um, or into, inside a joint. I'm thinking here around something like the knee. Um, you can see the outer margins of the meniscus. You can see the collateral ligaments very nicely. But you can't visualize into the joint as such. You can't see into the cruciates. You can't see into that joint recess. And with the ankle as, a, as, a, as an example, um, you can actually see deep into the anterior recess of the talocrural joint quite nicely. And the more you plant a flex, obviously, the more you expose the talar dome, um, the more you can see uh, the articular cartilage and the joint recess and how it moves dynamically. But it's just an important thing, I think, to know that you can't see into a joint with ultrasound. It's not, not the same as MRI, for example, in that regard. Actually, just, just on that, I, again, I'm, I'm not familiar with it, but I vaguely recall seeing a number of studies on evaluating gout with ultrasound. So if they're not looking mm. into a joint, what are they looking at? Yeah, so well, with, with gout, certainly with gout and, and rheumatology stuff, you're looking at joint capsules around the joint. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you're looking at, you can, you can pick up a, a fantastic array of, of sonographic if you like, findings now around inflammatory joint conditions mm. uh, that can really impact care and, and, and sort of drive management. And, and gout falls under that category. And yeah. uh, I'm lucky enough that I start, I'm starting to see a lot more of this now, I guess in my radiology role, more than my... Uh, more than my physiotherapy role probably but certainly seeing patients who have been screened for early synovitis that is off, is, is is active but at a subclinical level so particularly interesting when a patient would come in with say uh, joint pain they're not obviously thickened there's no obvious sort of synovitis sort of appearance of any of their joints in their hands but you can scan it <clears throat> and pick up low level synovitis and maybe other sort of changes around the joint give you clues clinically that maybe that the way it's heading for them is is down more than inflammatory arthropathy route it's the same with gout but gout you can see see gout tophi very nicely on ultrasound very very clearly um but also you can see it obviously around tendons as, as well as as well as joints sure yeah Stu, how how uh how often would you say you reach for the ultrasound in, in your not in your radiology clinic, of course, but if you were doing a sort of uh, <laughs> using a foot, you know a, a foot and ankle clinic, put yourself in the position of a podiatrist in private practice. Uh, how often would would you or should you be reaching for something like this? Uh, is it is it a case of I'm going to do it on everyone because it always adds value and I've trained to do it and I've paid for the machine? Or is there a, um, yeah, there's, there's, lo- there's lots of factors aren't there impacting upon it in mm. terms of your use um such as paying for a machine which is expensive and feel like you <laughs> feel like you get your money's worth out of it i guess um but no i mean for, for me it, it really it's a difficult one to give you a hard and fast answer on but for me it always comes back to being very patient specific um and I, I don't necessarily use it for absolutely every patient um do i think it has a, has a really useful role in clinic yes um but it's patient specific. So it comes, you know, the use of it is drawn out of that clinical history. You know, your key, your key sort of objective and subjective history and drawn out of that, you know, I want to have a look at that, have a look at that tendon, see what tendon, that tendon's looking like in a bit more detail. Um, you know, I want to look around that joint recess. I think the other thing about it is as well that this is sometimes a more challenging thing to understand, I think, is that Although, as I've just sort of described, when you're usually thinking about imaging and the, and the rationale to request imaging, you're usually drawing that out of your clinical, you know, that of your subjective, your objective history, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but ultrasound does also offer you the opportunity to uh, evaluate an area and rule out and rule in uh, differentials uh, really quite nicely. So I see, I see quite a few patients with um, sort of midfoot and forefoot OA in radiology. They get referred in for injections. Um, and I start to evaluate the ultrasound because ultimately that's what I'm there to do in radiology. Um, but also I, I always put quite a strong clinical spin on it as well. But um, it's always quite interesting. You know, one, one clinical sort of example of that would be, say, um, looking at kind of the, the, the medial aspect of the foot and looking at the articulation of, say, navicular and the medial cuneiform um, and getting asked to do injections in and around that area. And actually then with ultrasound, you start to evaluate it and actually it's tibant. It's tibant tendinopathy or if tibant changes around it, 
I'm certainly not going to want to put steroid in and around a tendinopathic tip until its insertion, for example, particularly. So there's just, there's, there's, there's just those little scenarios like that. We're actually using the ultrasound as just as, just as, as you would with any clinical test to gain information can help change your management or change your decision making around it. But it doesn't, ha doesn't happen every time. You know, I think, I think that's a really important message as well. It doesn't happen every time, but you're just giving yourself more information from that clinical, clinical experience, I guess. Actually, just yeah. on that, Stuart. We've referred to it at least. Oh, oh sorry, go on, Greg. Yeah. Go on. Sorry. No, I was just going to make the, Stuart made a, used the word a couple of times about obviously diagnosis, those kinds of things. What about prognosis in, in that I know, and, and I know they have no evidence to support this, but I know of um, at least a couple of podiatrists here in Australia who are using it at point of care. And yep. I wouldn't say they're being arrogant, but they, they are very, very confident in looking at things like plantar fasciitis on ultrasound and predicting, yep. predicting the response to treatment. Like they're looking, yeah. at, looking at the hypo, the extent of the hypoechoic signal. So really my question comes down, I'm not saying they're doing right or wrong, with no evidence, but they're confident that they can use the ultrasound. And I assume looking at a tendon, can you... Um, use that as part of a prognosis as, as opposed to a diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. I want to come back and give you some really specific, oh, okay. uh, <laughs> articles, but I probably can't, but I, I think I, have to be, I think we have to be very careful around that kind of stuff. I think, I think the, the, the evidence base around that I'm aware of around using imaging in a, in a sort of a, a prognostic sort of capacity mm. is quite difficult. And that kind of, I guess you're kind of referring a little bit Craig to that serial scanning scenario yeah. where you're kind of serial scanning somebody to, to try and use the imaging findings ultimately to state to the patients whether they're improving or not. I guess that's kind of the premise, isn't it, of what we're discussing here. And um, I think you have to be really careful with that. And, and, and that's, that's kind of borne out of the fact that we know that we can find so many of these findings in asymptomatics as well. Okay, let's not, let's not, let's not, um, let's not sort of forget that aspect of it. And, and, and so I, I think, Isolate dependence upon um, upon a find in terms of prognostically using it or serial scanning. I think it has to be done very very carefully. I don't think we've got enough evidence based out there to to, su to support that in widespread use. I don't think I'd be, I'd be very open to, to finding out more more about it. Oh, I, I I mean I agree totally about the evidence base, but I, I I think what I find striking is the confidence and their self belief that they can do that. And I mean they may they may may well be right, but. Again, I take your point. You've got to be damn careful doing it. But, um, but they're yeah. they just looking at the thickness of the plantar fascia, the extent of the hypochoic signal, you know, saying, well, this is going to be not going to respond too well, but it's, well, it's going to take a while, that kind of uh, issue, yeah. yeah. And I think, and I think and I'm not going to get involved in, um, you know, the, the specifics of that scenario that you're sort of saying there. But I think, I think in some ways we can draw sort of um, – we can draw a comparison here to the dangers of imaging a little bit in, in that in that we can over um, we can overplay significance upon some of the findings that we encounter in imaging. And I think that's why it then comes back to the issue about training and why training with people who you know, have good skills and, and, and who are competent around what they're doing is really important because what you don't want to do is to start uh, creating people using ultrasound, particularly when systems are getting cheap or cheaper they're getting much, much better. You know, like iPhones get better, they get cheaper. Same thing with ultrasound, no different. Um, and they're getting more accessible. And what you don't want is people using uh, more and more imaging in point of care scenarios and placing too much significance on the, on the findings sure. um, and, 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 and giving people the wrong information in terms of prognostic or, or whatever, you know. Actually, that's, 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 always, that's the danger with it, which is why the safety is so important. Sure, this is a good, good point to bring up a question that Robert asked earlier on. Um, yeah. And I think I think actually you might have this on your list, but Robert sort of asked, um, do you think there is a risk with the increased availability of imaging that will medicalize and treat normal variants? Yes, and I, I think yeah, yes, no, I mean, pretty pretty <laughs> obvious you. answer here. Yeah, and I, oh. I, I, you know what? The, the wrong thing for me to do would be to sit in any of these kind of scenarios and just say, right, guys, I want to go sound. It's the answer to everything. Every time you put it on somebody, it's a eureka moment, and and, and you find the answer and you know, you forget all about your clinical skills. It, it, the reality is, is that it, it sits alongside, for me particularly, as a clinical adjunct. And um, But it, as, a, as for all those issues we just mentioned, basically, Craig, I mean, the answer is yes, I think, I think there are risks around it. And that's why it's so important to, to, to mention safety and how to train and, and to link into things like case, et cetera, et cetera, and people who are, who are teaching it in the, in the right way. 
Sure, yeah, thanks. Perfect. Um, we've had a question from Sean about differentiating between intermetatarsal uh, lesions, uh, particularly bursa and neuroma. Is one of your case studies a forefoot? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, well, maybe, maybe, maybe should we, well, maybe we'll leave that question to then. Yeah, we can do it. We can go into it now. Oh, it's fun. Yeah, I'll go into um, some more images. Some more imagery, yeah. if that's all right with you. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. It's fine. I think, I think, um, and what it does before I get it to some pictures up, I'll just talk about that a bit more. And I've already mentioned it a little bit. It's when I just find that with particularly with the foot and ankle, one of the great things about ultrasound is getting more information about a region. You know, I get loads of Morton's neuroma referrals, um, particularly in radiology for um, query Morton's neuroma, forefoot pain, please inject. You know, all these kinds of things. And so I very much view forefoot pain as a as a as a region and, so, and, and then I will sort of set about my investigation both through clinical tests and clinical exam uh, which I hope are as good as, as the podiatrist um, and, and, and then use ultrasound alongside it and neuroma and bursa are one of those classic ones because as soon as, soon as you start to, to see these patients with forefoot pain you're looking at with, with ultrasound you're looking at metatarsophalangeal joints from a clinical perspective you're saying okay is there any element here that might indicate a stress response around one of the metatarsals we're looking at the plantar plate we talked about earlier, Craig, which has its own perils probably, as most of these things do. Um, we're looking at submetatarsal bursae, all of these different things that are around these areas. Um, but when it comes on to the metatarsal, uh, to the Morton's neuroma, um, he says, there's a little uh, link. Um, <laughs> well, smooth segue into... Uh... Yeah, yeah, smooth. <laughs> <laughs> as, he, as he clunkily sort of moves around his desktop. Um, I've got a picture here of a Morton's neuroma. Um, I'm going to have to explain it because it probably won't make a huge amount of sense just looking at it. Um, so if we go there, share screen. That worked? Yep. Yep. I'll put that in the middle. Um, so what you've got here is, is basically a this is a this is a longitudinal view. So it comes back to what I was talking about earlier. It's a long view on a on a on a web space. Okay, so you've got toe, toe, gap in between. There's my probe in long view. My phone is my probe. There's my probe in long view, okay? The, the top one is a better one to see it, actually. But invariably, that there's a bursal and a neuroma complex together. Um, and so, for me, they often come hand in hand. And the tricky thing you've got with this area is it's quite a tricky area sometimes to visualize, if we're honest about it, because they can be quite small gaps in between people's toes, which is inherently the reason why they've probably got a problem there as well in the first place. Um, you're dependent upon the quality of the machine that you've got. Um, and also you're dependent upon the tissue quality around this area. Okay, so all of those things are going to impact your image quality. But ultimately you're looking for a bursal kind of collection around it here, um, which is a darker area of fluid. That should be compressible. So you should be able to move that with your, with your thumb and with the probe, you should be able to compress that region. And then usually the neuroma is a more hypoechoic um, and usually fairly homogenous kind of appearance. And when I say homogenous, it's a, it's a classic kind of ultrasound term. I mean, appearing the same, um, you know, sort of hypoechoic or darker, but still has some sort of echo to it or brightness to it um, within that. And ultimately, you'd, ideally, you'd like to try and link it up to the nerve so you could see the nerve running into the neuroma. As we all know, that's part of the pathology. Um, but sometimes that's very difficult to do um, just because of the position, because of, 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 of subtle angulations of the probe and how you move things. I didn't bring up the slide earlier about an isotropy, but, but, but things, one of the key things with, um, with ultrasound, maybe I'll do it now, it's not necessarily relevant for, for, for um, Morton's, but it's an important limitation of, um, of, uh, of ultrasound. Let me have a look and see if I've got it here. Uh, so this is, a, this is a picture of an isotropy on a patella tendon, okay? And I'll just mention it because it just makes you realise the use dependence and the subtleties of the skills required to get images. So something like a Morton's neuroma can sometimes be quite a challenging thing to find. Um, so you can see here, this is the patella tendon, the blue line, and this is my probe. So I'm exactly perpendicular to the structure. And then I get a nice bright white tendon. This is an isotropy taking effect. So you can see that if you took it off the angle here, you're talking what, 20 degrees off the, off the main upright position of the probe here. There's the tendon, still exactly the same. My probe's angled, so the sound waves are coming in, hitting the tendon and bouncing back off over this way. So they're, not, they're not going back to your really nice, fancy, expensive probe and up to your ultrasound machine. And what that does is it means your tendon looks really dark. Okay, so it changes the brightness of the image quite dramatically. 
So if you go back to something like a Morton's neuroma, and it's not a great example of, um, of uh, an isotrope by any means, but subtle angulations of, of, of your probe in between those two toes on that nerve will just give you alterations in terms of how dark you see it, how bright you see it. And so sometimes you have to work quite hard to get an image like the top one in particular, where you've got a really distinct difference between the bursal component of it and the neuroma component of it as well. Um, but that, yeah, that hopefully will answer that question. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Um, you, you've mentioned a couple of times, Stu, um, yeah. as, uh, we, uh, as has uh, Rob on his question, and we may as well ad address it now, the, uh, yeah. the false positives, you know, the, the, the normal variants. Well, yeah. I, I only know this because I've been looking into the... You know, you, you take big scans of asymptomatic populations, um, and more than are present in 25%, abnormal ATFL in 30%, and a plant of tear in 50%. You know, that, yeah. Your understanding of that with, um, oh, sorry, am I? Am, yeah, you're just dropping out a little bit, Ian, but I think, I think Stuart knows the question. Yeah, oh. yeah. yeah. yeah, I, think, yeah, I, think, yeah. I, think I know, I think I know where, where you're going. Yeah, that's all right. Um, I, yeah, abs absolutely. And, and I guess it's always good to hark back to kind of clinical scenarios that I, that I kind of encounter, um, which, which summarise these issues, I think, really nicely. And uh, I think one of the situations is around uh, injection therapy, actually. And so when either something's highlighted on, on, an, on a scan, uh, and then there's immediately on that, oh, there's something on the scan, they need an injection. Or, um, or there's, a clinical, there's a clinical kind of uh, suggestion that this is the issue. You do a scan and, and yes, it's there, but um, you then have to, you're in a difficult situation. You see it on an ultrasound image, um, but you don't think it's clinically relevant. And how do you deal with that? It's, it's the same kind of issue, isn't it, around um, those kind of asymptomatic findings and how we handle them. And, um, I, I, I just I, I think it's exactly the same with with the shoulder and rotator cuff tears and, and, and I did a speech in um, Denmark I was really lucky enough to be invited to do a speech in Denmark recently around this topic and it just it always sort of brings me back to that clinical integration of it um, you know if you've got somebody coming in with four foot pain and just scanning and you're doing a clinical examination and you're doing an ultrasound of the area uh, and yes, okay, you, you, you're picking up a couple of bursal cut sort of areas, Morton sort of bursal complexes, um, but they're not symptomatic when you give them a good squeeze. They're not symptomatic on molders and various other clinical tests. And actually what you think is more significant is the metatarsophalangeal joint or, or whatever. Um, you, you're putting it in context straight away, aren't you, in terms of the, the relevance of it. Um, but that, that for me is, 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 is a justification for why imaging sits quite nicely alongside that that clinical kind of scenario and, and, and it sort of shows scope around it um because it, it gives it gives clarity on those findings you know I, I see situations in all my clinical environments all the clinical roles i work in where people are having management dictated to uh based upon an image uh and they come in and you, and you assess them from a clinical perspective and then clearly the the, the image isn't necessarily um, the main issue or, or, the, or the report of the image isn't the main issue um, it's that clinical it's that clinical role around it that clinical examination alongside the image is so important does that answer your question I think I've probably gone off, off on a tangent a bit it does you, 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 you're a serious expert when you can answer a question when you didn't even get the full question that's just how good you are <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed um, there was a question earlier from Emma, and I can't scroll down to see it now, Craig. It was okay. really early on about uh, a question for Stuart about a certain um, type of machine, and I'm just conscious if we don't answer it now, it will get lost in the yeah, feed. The, um, Emma was asking about the, have you come across the butterfly IQ ultrasound okay. scanner? Yeah, so now, so now being, in, being in my sort of geeky areas of interest that I, I seem to have ended up in, I, I, I have a reasonable awareness of most ultrasound machines that are out there. I haven't used it. I'm aware of it. I think it's I think it's a it's a probe attached to a screen, isn't it? I think for that one. I don't think it's wireless. But I mean, basically, I guess the key point to make here is what I went back to earlier on is saying that you know over the next five years, this technology is going to just soar, and and all sorts of wonderful things are going to be coming out. Um, there are wireless probes out there now 
where you don't actually have a wire between the probe. It goes through a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connection onto an iPad or onto a TV screen. Um, so, and they can they can sort of sit sit in your pocket, uh, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's got a, it's got a cable. This one. So there's there's cable ones and there's ones without cables. Um, I think the really the really important thing to, to bear in mind is you know with the, with any of these things is is make sure it's fit for, for purpose as to what you're going to use it for, and particularly um, for, for for podiatrists, it it really needs to be um, to ideally have a, a reasonable range in, in terms of resolution. You're going to be looking at stuff that's going to be quite superficial. You're also going to want to have a good Doppler function on it, uh, particularly for some of the joints and things you're going to be evaluating. You want to be able to pick up any blood flow in it, if there's any synovitis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. The, if, the, if the question is more around, are there any good kind of thing, I'm probably not in a position to comment too much. But um, there, are lots of, there, are, there are lots of things out there. Um, it's an exciting area of development, I think, from a technology point of view. Um, but the training has to sit alongside Let's sit alongside it. I like the way that guy was wearing it around his neck, like the way medical students wear stethoscopes. Very, I think that's what I, I think I can see that being a selling point for Emma. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but also, a lot of people always refer to ultrasound. You know, it's point of care ultrasound, the next stethoscope. You know, it's a common, it's a common thing that I often hear. Um, and it kind of does have similarities, I guess, a little bit. Some of the things we've talked about, you know, to an extent. It looks quite trendy, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very cool. Um, so, any other images you wanted to share, Stuart? Yeah, looking yeah. At time. Got, I wanted to make, yeah, make sure. Yeah, bits and pieces here. So we've done Morton's, haven't we? We've had a look at that. Um, so we've talked about, uh, tip ants always quite an interesting one because I don't think, uh, certainly from a physio perspective, we don't, I don't tend to get that excited or that tend to think a huge amount about tip ant as being a pathological sort of issue. Um, but um, certainly it's, it's something that we, we see quite often um, in radiology um, that tip ant often gets issues as it sort of, uh, glides over the top of sort of the um telenavicular joint that kind of stuff i'm just trying to share my screen sorry guys this is just tip and so we often see that these come in with sort of you no know, query lump on the front of ankle what is the lump um or they come in with um sort of anterior ankle pain and um it just brings me back to what I kind of what I talked about earlier is that you know you've got a region of symptoms and okay it's quite diffuse sometimes it's not that easy to, to differentiate it clinically um, but you can see here in ultrasound, you can very easily start to pick apart the differences in symptoms or differences, in, sorry, in, um, in appearances. Now, this is the symptomatic Tiban cross-sectionally. This is the asymptomatic Tiban. Um, and it's got some fluid around it in this image here. Uh, and then bottom right, sorry, I've lost the picture there. That's just Tiban coming across that sort of articulation medially, this distal insertion uh, and the changes around there and how... You know, when you're doing these injections around joints, we haven't talked a lot about injections, but when you're doing these injections around joints, just consider the health of the tissues around it locally. Um, it's not always as simple as saying there's a pain in that area, therefore it's that, it's, it's got to be that joint adjacent to it. There's lots of other things that, that, that are in that area, and the foot and ankle anatomy is very interesting, complex. So ultrasound helps you sort of differentiate that. Um, tip post. Um, here we go. It's like a rat, rapid fire from the archives here now, isn't it? I've opened the vault. Um, so tip post, I mean, tip post is an, it, again, clinically, obviously, medial ankle pain. We, we tend to be pretty confident in terms of our abilities to pick that up and differentiate it. Um, I think some interesting stuff around these kind of things is um, that I see, again, from my experiences in radiology and things, is, is sometimes the differences in appearance between a tip post that has a really strong inflammatory driver from an inflammatory arthropathy, perhaps, and from some, from a more mechanical perspective. And so you can see here, I've popped a couple of arrows on here, uh, amateur style, uh, just, to, just to show you some of the sort of synovial thickening. This is the tendon in cross-section of the media. This is the tip post. Um, and this is the synovial sheath around it. And it's really quite thickened. It doesn't mean they've got an inflammatory arthropathy, but sometimes you do see quite a difference uh, in terms of that synovial hypertrophy in some of these joints compared to the mechanical ones. That's a long axis view. Excuse me, my throat's given up me a bit. The, the, the long axis view here of, uh, of that tendon. So again, you can see nicely fluid collections around it and evaluate it. Doppler to really pull apart the tenosynovitis um, kind of component to it. And I guess when, you, when you're looking at sort of how 
imaging is helpful. I guess it confirms your diagnosis in terms of uh, it gives you more information to feel more confident about your diagnosis from your clinical assessment. But also, um, sometimes when you evaluate these areas, they've just got more of a tendinopathic appearance rather than a really strongly reactive tenosynovitis with a really strong inflammatory component. And so sometimes that can lead to changes in how you manage it, subtle sort of changes in how you manage it or how you approach it. Um, but just gives you a couple of ideas there of how you can visualize structures around the ankle and how well you can visualize them. These are on, these are on pretty high level machines. Um, another couple of things. Um, foreign bodies. Some people have probably seen this before. I usually wheel this one out. It's one of my uh, one of my favourite favourite ones I've, I've encountered over the, over the, over a while. Um, but this is a patient who came in with chronic anterior ankle pain. Um, had had MR. They'd had physio. They'd had podiatry. They'd had um, orthotics or insoles. I know Ian, you've got a bit of an issue around the words around that, so I have to be a bit careful which one I use. <laughs> I'm not really sure what you like and what you don't like, so I'll use both. Uh, <laughs> Ash supports. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, basically they'd had lots of conservative management. Um, and um, I, I started going through the patient. I was, you know, it's one of those situations where you're sort of thinking, okay, crikey, well, what am I actually going to be able to offer this person different to what they've had before? I'm not, I haven't got a whole unique tool in my, in my box that I can wheel out. But what I did do is pop the ultrasound and have a look at the front of the ankle um, and she had this really significant and large foreign body right under where she had her symptoms. And it was a two centimeter long wood splinter um, that got into the front of her ankle. And you, yeah, you might think, okay, well, hang on a minute. If I, if I had a two centimeter long wood splinter, I'm pretty sure I would remember it or I'd, or I'd know about it. But um, this patient, this patient didn't. And um, if you look through the, the actual literature around foreign bodies, quite a lot of the wood splinters do actually go unnoticed sometimes with patients if they're doing something. So that was quite an interesting one. And I actually ended up going to um, my pod podiatric surgical colleagues who actually um, removed it under ultrasound, actually. Uh, and she did really well. I took it out. But you can see here, interestingly, the body kind of seals it off in like a kind of a halo around it. Uh, just It's interesting how the body kind of reacts to these things. and just sort of locks it down, seals it off, and puts it into a capsule. So you always often have around a, a foreign body have this hypochoic kind of area of tissue uh, around it um, and maybe to finish with or I've got a couple more here but um, I know you guys love a bit of plantar fascia so let's put this up um, <laughs> so plantar fascia this is this is one of the slides from the courses actually um, but just on plantar fascia so that's how you would scan it that's how you'd approach it a couple of references here but bottom left here is what the plantar fascia normally looks like okay so to orientate you because otherwise you're looking at that thinking that sounds Great, Stu, but I haven't got a clue what I'm looking at. Um, say, that, say, that's the, say that's the plantar fascia there. This is the calc. This is the plantar fascia. And that's my probe in long axis like that. Okay, so I'm looking at the tendon at the, the, the plantar fascia inserted onto the calcaneus in long axis view there. Uh, and you can see here, this is a normal plantar fascia insertion. It, it may even be mine uh, one lunchtime. Um, you can see it's nice bright white. It's not particularly thickened. And you can see it coming up through here. This is a, this is a pathological um, plantar fascia so you can see it's markedly thickened it's much darker and so it, you know again in terms of your reporting or evaluation of this you know dark tendon tissue tends to be um, more pathological tends to, tends to be more tendinopathic um, but you've got to be again importantly key you know, really on your angles you've got to make sure you're visualizing that structure really well and a top tip around that is if the bone underneath it is not bright white uh, then you're probably not going to be totally perpendicular to it. So um, when anybody sends me an image to look at, you can always tell the image quality or exactly where they are uh, by the other tissues around it and how that uh, how they appear as well. But that's just an idea around plantar fashion, how that can how that can look. Cool. Just just uh, on that just on that image there, Stuart. That's the sort yeah. of point I was sort of making earlier on. Wouldn't it be neat if we could take an image like that and then somehow quantify the hypochoic signal, uh, quantify the thickness? but then be able to factor that into our prognosis. I mean, I just yeah, think, no, be, you know, like we, th this is going to take a long time. This is not going to take very long at all. You know what I mean? It'd be, it'd be, it'd be great. Yeah. To be able yeah. To do that. yeah I, I, so I think it'd be fantastic. And I think what really excites me, I think a little bit around all these things is that the, the, the I guess the, the movement, if you like around 
integration of these things into what we're doing as, as our health professionals, as podiatrists, as physios, et cetera, et cetera, is, is leading us into these discussions. And there just simply isn't the evidence base out there oh, to support man. any of these kind of things at the moment. But, but, it's, but it's areas that need to be explored. Um, you know, we need to be exploring, you know, what the impact is of ultrasound on, on things. We know, we know for patient satisfaction is, is pretty good. But you know, what impact is it making around prognosis? What impact is it making around our ability or our decision making about requesting other imaging? Are we reducing other imaging less because of it? Are we recruiting or requesting it more initially as we start to use ultrasound? There's loads of things that could be evaluated and, and looked into um, with this. Yeah, but absolutely, Craig, you know, those, all those sorts of things are very interesting, very interesting topics. Yeah. Can you just stop your share screen for a moment? I've just got something. Emma just posted something. Let me just share this. This is actually, I don't know, I, I never saw this, but you may have seen this, Stuart. Um, this is the General American Medical Association, the cardiology edition last month. Time to add a fifth pillar to bedside physical examination, inspection, palpation, percussion, oscillation, and now in sonation. <laughs> and that's pretty much what you're saying, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I, I think um, you said that was from a, a cardiology cardiology yeah, last month. Yeah, yeah. So, so obviously, obviously, POCUS or point of care is yeah. is not only MSK; it, it also covers emergency medicine, and it's a huge growth area in emergency medicine in terms of fast scanning and all this kind of stuff, which isn't is nowhere near my expertise. But but there's a huge um, there's a huge growth around that, and um, you know, that's the whole thing I said earlier about, you know, is it the next stethoscope? It's exactly the same thing. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's an interesting, it's an interesting area that's developing. Oops. You all right? Hang on. What's, okay. Um, you okay? You okay, Craig? Sorry, you know, just just a couple of things were happening, and um, actually, Some, uh, again, someone's we banging actually, on their cage. They want to come out. Yeah, the dogs are barking as well. But, <laughs> time's up. Time's up. Um, it's his wife on the door. <laughs> yeah, they'll be fine. I'll just ignore them. Like, wife, I guess look, we're almost out of time, but I I just just say I'm an average podiatrist and an average, yeah. perhaps solo, you know, smaller clinic. Should I buy one and do a course? Um, uh, okay really right really good question um i would i would i would i would sort of um first of all i would consider it and i guess my other thing to say with this is never an easy answer is it i sound like a politician sitting on the fence but the first thing to say as well is actually is it depends which country you're in <laughs> um and this is one of the things off the ultrasound side being having quite a global reach um is that the scope of practice and the governance around its use varies from country to country so that's a, that's a very sensible uh, answer to start with. Just know what happens in your country and liaise with your professional body around your scope of practice, your insurance, and whether you can use it or not. If you take all those things into consideration, you've got a green light, um, then I, I think it's a great adjunct to have. And I think it's going to be something that grows in the future going forwards. Um, I think doing something where you uh, don't commit to necessarily a full-blown program from the outset and just go on a course or you, or you go and sit in someone's clinic to just experience it's how it's used, uh, what it's like to use it. It's not for everybody. Um, I don't think it's ever going to get to the stage where absolutely everybody is using it. I don't think it's for everyone's everyone's you know cup of tea. Um, but I think it is does have a role as being an adjunct in the right hands. Um, and I, but I would also say that um, if you're a podiatrist and you think should you go and use it, I first of all ask you the question of say, well, how much clinical experience do you have? And how much mileage do you have at the coal face? Because that's ultimately a really essential foundation. We have a little graphic that I put out sometimes of the building blocks and where ultrasound fits. And you know, if you if you're coming straight out of of, of training with a very sort of uh, green perspective on things and haven't got any of those core kind of clinical reasoning skills, then if you start bringing ultrasound into that, I don't I don't think it sits very well. Uh, I don't feel necessarily very comfortable with that. Um, so I'd say get your get your core skills. Um, if you've got you know, if you've got really good clinical experience, you're looking to add something extra to your practice, then yeah, I, 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 would, I would consider it. I think it's an interesting adjunct. Yeah, actually, interesting, interesting point you made there because I, I actually think clinically I'm pretty good at, say, uh, at diagnosing and assessing some of the plantar plate dysfunction. And yeah. yet I know of clinicians who will send every single one off for an ultrasound to confirm it. And mm. so it raises the question, well, if, if I'm pretty confident it's there, I send them off for an ultrasound. Well, what's that going to change my treatment? 
probably nothing. So my, my policy is I'll go ahead and treat, but if it doesn't respond soon, I might then get it ultrasound it down the track. So it's just, I, I take your point about what you're making. And I think that, you know, we don't want to lose those clinical skills. No, 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 absolutely. Ab- absolutely. And you don't want, you don't want to be in a situation where none of us are actually talking to patients, but they're just coming in and we're yeah. kind of like, they're feeling a sheep in the waiting room coming in and then we're just scanning them. We don't, we don't want to be, in those, yeah. we, don't, we don't, we don't really want to be in those situations from a clinical perspective. I don't think, yeah. you know, no. um, yeah. would I, would I be right in assuming that most musculoskeletal physiotherapists um, are probably heading down the pathway of getting an ultrasound at the point of care? No, uh, I, I don't know. And um, I want to explore current practice a bit more probably actually. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly the numbers that are doing it. I, I don't think so. No, not, not necessarily. Yeah. And I think, I don't, as I said, I don't think it's for everybody out there. And I think, uh, as I'm sure it's, it's with podiatry, um, within physiotherapy, that we, we all have slightly different um, biases, if you like, schools yeah. of thought, uh, rationale, reasoning, perspectives. And, and, and certainly, you know, bringing imaging into a, a clinical scenario isn't for everyone. Not everyone agrees with it. Mm. We've mentioned some of the reasons tonight already of, 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 of some of the risks around its use and, and why it's important to have that training and, and, and clinical experience. So, um, no, I don't think, I don't think yeah. everybody's used. I think it's still probably a relatively small number actually in the big picture. Mm, okay. I, 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 maybe it's just the ones I deal with seem to be doing it. Um, but they, they do a lot of tendon work. I mean, that's all they do. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, the guys who work in around tendons, uh, it's a, it's a natural thing to kind of, uh, to have, but I, I, I you know, I think, the sort of a more broad kind of, if you like, in the UK, where it's, you know, kind of the, the MSK community clinic. Um, I, I don't think it, it's, it's commonplace yet. I think it's growing. It's an area of interest and people are picking it up. And it and whether it gets to the stage where you're going to have every single person in that room or that department, sorry, <laughs> use an ultrasound, I, I don't think so. I think you just need to have, you know, one, two people in there who are competent, who can assist with cases that need to be differentiated further or whatever um, as well. Sure. You got any more questions there, Ian? I think. Uh, no, just actually one that just got messaged to me about um, key references in the area. I know you put up a couple of references on your plantar fascia slide, and I've been on your website as well. You're really generous with information on there. There's some cracking case studies. We'll obviously put a link to that for everyone. But yeah. are there any um, sort of go-to papers that you could say would, would ignite some fires or, or you know, really elicit some interest from people if they want to read a bit more? Yeah, there are. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a. There's, I'll have a dig around, and I'll try and um, find some. Maybe share them. Share them on the on the Facebook feed. Um, great, that'd be good. Yeah, that'd be great. But um, and I think there's also some some really interesting stuff to read around is around um, the governance, the safety of it as well. I know I have to keep coming back to the boring stuff a little bit, but that doesn't sound interesting, Stu. I'll be honest. No, no. <laughs> no. But, um, you know, if, if you're looking at if you want to look at ultrasound sort of training and, and, and competency, you know, look at the RCR website, the Royal College of Radiologists. There's some really good stuff on there. Um, I, I've certainly got some articles around you know ultrasound use and, and impact. But where we're la- where we're lacking in the point of care is, is as, as we as we touched on earlier, is that, is that there's quite a, there's, there's quite a sort of a paucity of evidence and, and research and articles out there just saying about how it's used in that clinical scenario. There's lots of there's lots out there saying um, clinical assessment, imaging, surgery, and, and correlations of those kinds of things. But it's more around those those sort of those softer kind of clinical scenarios of how it impacts the management um that we need to be building more evidence around yeah, i think i think a key one there and going back to the plantar plate i mean it'd be nice to see a study where you randomize um suspected plantar plate issues to um clinical diagnosis treat um clinical diagnosis ultrasound treat um any ac- difference in outcomes between those two groups yeah, um yeah so did the ultrasound lead to enough alterations in the management that led to a better outcome, and I, 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 I wouldn't want to predict it would. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. Also, and also around you know patient adherence, you know, or, or you know, patient understanding, all those kind of things as well. Sometimes things can be can be impacted upon by it. But yeah. absolutely, you're absolutely right, Craig. Those those are where now we need to be asking those. You know, I, I use the thing you know, hashtag tough questions kind of thing. You know, on on, on social media because. Because this is this is this is this, is, this was the core kind of interest that I had out of it. You know, when when I started doing the website, uh, I went online as part of my training. There used to be loads of websites with galleries of images. You know, just see galleries of images. And I'm like, well, what what the hell does that mean in terms of actually for the patient's journey? Um, and that's why we start to try and build more case studies. And you know, my time's more compromised now, so I don't get so much time to do it. But hopefully, over the next uh, few months, I'm going to try and refocus and release some more case studies around 
the impact of, of what what I feel it does. But again, it's not a study; it's anecdotal, I guess, which is that which is the comeback. <laughs> okay, look, I think on that note, the the hour has gone, Stuart, so quickly. Sorry, Craig. Uh, Craig, yeah. sorry, sorry. One last question okay. just come in, and I didn't want to mention it because it's my favourite topic uh, at the moment because uh, it's about nocebo. Ah. That's for oh, Memo, okay. and, and you know the the the. I guess the debate about whether you get out a big machine and you sort of medicalize this scenario and it has this nocebo effect versus you know, some people that the, the theatre of it would make them feel so well looked after and so confident that, that and so happy that perhaps it would it would have the opposite effect. I mean, any comments on that, Stu? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, I think it's an interesting one. I think the first thing to say around this is that every patient's pain experience is very different, isn't it? And, and it's driven by a lot of different things. And we know that in our clinical practice, you can do some things with one patient that helps, another patient doesn't help. Sometimes I see patients in extended scope physiotherapy clinics who haven't responded to physiotherapy. That's not because they've had the wrong physiotherapy, it's because they haven't, they haven't got the concept, they haven't been maybe been reassured around some fears. And sometimes ultrasound can really break down some barriers like that in terms of, in terms of educating them on you know, just saying, look, the tissue quality is really good. You know, your, your anatomy is, is, you know, is, is intact. You know, you need to be engaging with this. And that, sometimes that really works really well. Um, and so, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I think, it's, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one to answer in terms of giving a, a, a black and white answer. But with those, those situations are so, um, so patient-specific and, and yeah. different that you have to find it. I can definitely see the scenario where someone's so worried that they're damaged and you can show them they're not damaged and that can be a really good thing. And then I guess there's that scenario we talked about, the false positives, um, yeah, where, yeah. You have to where, where suddenly careful. they can throw, throw us a bit of a curveball and, and induce yeah. a bit of fear and, and anxiety. Yeah, and the obvious, the obvious one to draw parallels on there in terms of the evidence base is around low back pain. An early imaging in low back pain, the impact that has on the patient's management outcomes. And so... Uh, we don't need any kind of reminders on the importance of how you you handle that but also things such as terminology as well are really important but i would also say one thing about it is in terms of when you're using it in a clinical perspective is it does help your understanding of normal aging actually and it, it and in some ways it in some ways it facilitates your understanding of normal aging as well um so you can then start to communicate that better to patients you can actually dampen down fears as well um and unfortunately i think still in the MSK sphere, if you like, there is still too much over medicalization and over over sort of a reliance upon structural findings from imaging, and, and you know that's that's hopefully something that can change with time. But in some ways, I, I feel that point of care ultrasound is actually a, a beneficial way to try and address that as well, try and try to facilitate that uh, improvement in trying to normalise some of the findings and and and, uh, and reassure patients that actually it's quite a normal thing to encounter. Yeah. Good. Okay. No worries. Well, look, look. Thanks so much, Stuart. I've um, uh, I've actually learned a lot in the, in the hour and eight minutes. Um, so, so thanks so much for joining us. Uh, for those who have joined late, this will be available on Facebook in about ten minutes. We will upload it to YouTube later on in the day. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can be notified in any new ones. So, um, thanks again, Stuart, and thanks, Ian. Thanks,